We all live in a digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust and to be trusted. We all despise control and desire freedom. We, we are all, all united. united. Hello, good morning, everyone. I hope everybody is okay. We are here in Katowice, Poland. I'm, I'm Natalia Soci Patricio. I'm the moderator of the session. And uh, we have uh, a lot of good moderator, uh, good, good finalists today uh, in this morning uh, to talk about uh, this, uh, this important topic that is the innovative approach to connectivity, internet connectivity. And uh, well, uh, we proposed this workshop, me and Raquel Renault and Juliana, to, to, in order to try to discuss some uh, examples that we see around the world, especially in Latin America, that we see a lot of good examples of uh, new approach or new ideas to, to deal with problems uh, related to internet connectivity and uh, try to spread a little bit the word for uh, in this regard, in this topic. And uh, here we will count with four panelists uh, from our region, Latin America especially. Uh, first, we have, uh, I'm not seeing here who is available, <laughs> everybody's, yeah, Juliana is our online moderator, is here, help me, <laughs> and but uh, uh, nice, uh, now I can see you in the, in the, <laughs> there, yeah, so, the idea is every panelist will have more or less like 15 minutes to, to talk about a little about the experience, examples, and bring some input to this session. And after this, we open the floor to some discussion, to questions from the, the online and on-site uh, public audience. And uh, so, first of all, uh, I imagine to start with our uh, colleague from Brazil, Renata, uh, from the National Telecommunication Agency in Brazil. I hope that she's there and could uh, start it. Yes, Renata? Yeah, um, hi, good morning, yeah. Good morning, so, so, so please, uh, please go ahead. Okay, <laughs> so I will share my screen in just a minute. Mm. Oh, this is done, okay, yeah. Uh, now um, I'm disabled to share to share. Um, I think the host have to give you privileges. Yeah. Okay. Do we have? Um, yes, I think exactly. <laughs> is it possible to everyone have this privilege? Is it so they can share? If it's not, there is okay. No, it's. Just need to have the okay from the IGF. Yeah, we are waiting here. <laughs> for... That's fine. That's fine. I think uh, they were okay. okay. So yeah, okay. okay, yeah, that's that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so go ahead. <laughs> it's it's um it's okay. Can you can you see the screen? 
just a minute. Yeah, yeah. now, yeah, it's yeah. okay. So, um, first of all, um, just, um, just a okay. So, um, great. Uh, just um, would like to start with um, saying, of course, good evening for everyone, or good afternoon, or good morning, as, um, as um, I am here, 5.30 in the morning, so depending where you are. And just um, would like to say hello to my colleagues, Raquel Reno, Juliana Novaes, Natalia, Lili Edina, Carlos Bello, Juan Perano, and say that's an honor to be here. And thank you very much for the invitation. I speak on behalf of Anatel and also the head of international affairs, Thais Nifidener, who cannot attend the session today. So um, okay. uh, taking advantage of the provocation of police questions that ask us about telecommunication infrastructure, expansion of significant access, lessons for improving universal access according to local needs. Uh, I would like to talk here about a recent, recent project developed as a result of memorandum of understanding signed between um, the National Telecommunication Agency and the British Embassy on the topic of uh, digital access development in September last year. Um, the first result, um, the first uh, project uh, resulting from this partnership was developed by the Association Progressive Communication, and its results were delivered uh, this year on October 25. The intention of this project was to enable the construction of an uh, environment to encourage community networks in Brazil and the development of concrete projects and studies with a view to contributing positively to the promotion of digital inclusion and the transformation process in the country. The initial projects developed under this partnership were focused on encouraging community networks, supporting small providers and conducting research aimed at the population of small municipalities to map the demand and gather input to contribute to a more assertive public policy, improving the agency's performance. As an alternative to traditional investment, options was thought with the possibility of building access networks in region with low financial returns, particularly in rural and isolated areas with difficult access. Um, we believe that community networks open the way for disconnected community to build their networks with their own equipment or hire networks and equipment from neighboring locations or even from satellite operators in more remote areas. These networks must comply, of course, with current regulation, especially regarding regulatory models and equipment certification requirements. Um, but in the end, uh, as a result, um, as a result, um, the following products were delivered. Uh, the first one uh, was an, uh, an executive summary entitled Police Brief. Uh, in a deep um, analysis of the current scenario of community networks in Brazil, which includes the mapping of existing community networks, the vision of the main actors involved through documentary research and consultations with stakeholders, identifying the main challenges and recommending potential improvements uh, so that they can be made for the development of digital access um, in the country. Um, the second product is a community networks manual that provides uh, general guidelines for the implementation of community networks. And it's available to the entire population in a very friendly language and tends to be a useful consultation tool. And finally, 
The third pro product delivered were two videos with guidance to the general public, interesting, simple, assertive, and accessible language, the main guidelines contained in the manual, in order to strengthen uh, the manual and generate interest in it. It has subtitles in Portuguese, English, and science. Um, the manual was worked on a 12 minute video and also one minute teaser of the video was also made. Um, we are confident that the results presented will bring uh, enormous benefits and concrete results for the expansion of digital access to the most vulnerable and exclude populations in Brazil and promote the increase of digital inclusion, uh, stimulate innovation, uh, create jobs, generate opportunities and business partnerships, which uh, is not an easy task. Uh, remembering that the, this year, the auction of 5G was held in 700 megahertz, 2.3 gigahertz, 3.5 gigahertz, and 26 gigahertz radio frequency that allow providing a greater volume of spectrum resources for providers to expand their network in addition to the bands of uh, restricted uh, radiation. Uh, if, we, if on the one hand, we are working to offer Brazilian society the most modern and fastest in the world communicate telecommunication, on the other hand, our challenge is even greater to seek connectivity solutions for part of the population that still lacks minimal infrastructure of access. In this scenario, we have a great geographic and income inequality challenges in the, the country. Um, community networks are an innovative solution for uh, connectivity gaps, enabling people to develop the model that best suits the reality. They represent a paradigm shift allowing any group, local administrations, entrepreneurs to develop a new access infrastructure and in this way, to enable individuals and communities to manage a common good. It provides connections and, um, and uh, autonomy and uh, infrastructure. Sits and learn not only to have access, but also to build the infrastructure together with others in the community. We know that a large part of the world's population cannot access the internet significantly Currently, because of this, uh, public policies in Brazil have been very focused on expanding broadband internet access. Uh, the expansion has been a constant concern if we structure expansion on the increase of higher high speed and increase in access networks, whether fixed or mobile broadband. Also, network in the increased presence of small providers in terms of volume and the market that contribute to the advancement of connectivity in the country. Together, uh, the small providers represent around 40% of the fixed broadband market and have been crucial in the internalization of connection in the country, internet in Brazil for smaller municipalities. With access to the internet, Communication in a small community improves and benefits local activity, as I said, commerce, education to accelerate the implementation of the universalization of the internet in the country. This project allowed for a better understanding of places in Brazil in terms of broadband, network expansion, network coverage, governance, and internet architecture, but also geographic inequalities between rural. Uh, urban indigenous peoples, uh, as well the different access from different social classes. Um, so uh, I just um, will talk a, a little bit more about the police brief and the manual. Uh, that's the that's the police brief. It's available on the on this website. Um, the police brief maps um, the intent maps the barrier. Found in public policy, regulation, economic, economic, cultural discrimination barriers in a way that contribute for community networks to flourish, sustainability in Brazil. That the work has uh, exactly uh, 158 pages, so it's a very deep document. 
um, the executive summary provides a set of recommendations and international best practice. Anatel has sought to adapt to the frequency band location allocation to allow access at a low cost in a more democratic way, not only through restricted radiation bands, but also through frequency bands for links to adequate solutions for coverage or solutions such as Amazon, for example, um, with the bands um, H and F. Um, this project represents not the final product, but a diagnosis that allows us um, to improve and to implement at the agents, such as proposals for administrative simplification and the study of new possibilities, such as the regulation of the limited private services that is used today to make community networks viable, but which it can be improved as it was not created for this purpose. Uh, open data were used to identify access and transport network in all locations in Brazil, whether urban or rural, and map the level and type of coverage in riverine communities, quilombolas, indigenous people, also map the technology and costs they have of incorporating indigenous people's right to promote their right to self-communication, self-determination, and their own media. Finally, the policy brief brings a series, a series of cross-cutting recommendations on gender affirmative action, such as using FUST and FUNTEL. Uh, those are, these are found uh, used in telecommunication development to adopt new paradigms and pay attention to community networks. Um, this document is also based on examples of good practice, such as Mexico, Canada, Colombia, Spain, not only on the merit of telecommunication, but also methodologies, consultations, and collaborative work, such as this one, which brought to get, uh, together efforts of all the sectors and create an opportunity for technical, economic, social, cultural, sustainability, and may development create a virtual circle of inclusion and empowerment in local communities. About the manual, this is the, oh, sorry, this is the manual, and um, the manual target audience is residents of locations that do not have connectivity, or have insufficient connectivity or uh, that are out of the economic reality of the location, both rural and also isolated areas. The manual is very interesting, especially because um, of this practical nature, and it is um, intended to encourage interest in community networks for these initial steps for an overview, both in the administrative, management, and social part, as well as um, in the technical part, explaining technical concepts of equipment, of network, as in, in the regulatory part, knowing whether the community network needs a grant, an authorization or not, and how to proceed uh, with the regulatory agency. The pillars uh, that led to this uh, elaboration sought popular education into consideration. So uh, it was a material constructed uh, without leaving that prior knowledge existed before, using the four uh, more simplified language, avoid, avoiding technical jargon, explaining the terms in English, and with very careful uh, illustrations. Uh, great care uh, was taken taken with the inclusion of diversity and uh, it's believed to be a way to overcome barriers to access. So to conclude, would like to say that we are very happy with the result of this project. Anatel has been working for many years to be able to make regulations and projects to expand access, especially broadband. We have evolved a lot in expanding access, especially mobile broadband with obligation in the notice. Uh, the result of this work, uh, which is the, just the beginning um, of this work, is a 
as a diagnosis and an operation manual. We are now starting a new phase at the agency, looking at community networks and small communities in remote rural areas. Uh, we intend to further adjust the regulation with this focus. Regulation needs to be a facilitator so that the population has access to quality infrastructure and internet. We are strengthening ties with representatives of community networks to get to know better and uh, have the necessary knowledge of where to act so um, that we can have more assertive regulations, simplifying the process and reaping good uh, results in which everyone can be connected and facilitate the everyone's life. Um, I'm grateful for the attention of everyone um, uh, presented here. And I end with the teaser uh, of the video produced at the APC. It's just uh, one minute. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Renata, for presenting this very insightful uh, practice and what is going on from the part of the Anatel in Brazil. It's really inspiring <laughs> to, to see this all this work and about this manual. Uh, stuff and this work that you are trying to make in collaboration with some uh, community networks there. And uh, before to go to our next speaker, I didn't tell to our audience what policy questions that we put as a provocation for, for our panelists. So I, I would to to fix this, yeah, to all our audience know uh, what we propose for our panelists. That first we provoke them uh, before the session to talk about uh, how we could, um, how can the significant expansion of mobile infrastructure around the world as well as other existing and emerging technologies such as satellite, fiber, and wireless networks be used to expand the affordable access. So we are thinking about how we can leverage infrastructure and technology, innovation and development in general. And uh, a second uh, provocation that we send before to, in order to, to give this idea to them, it's like to practical and local driven policy solutions. And I think the, the presentation from uh, Renata made it very well, like about talking about lessons that we can think about from successful policy solutions to universal access and meaningful connectivity uh, around the world. And this, in the case of Renata, she presented about Brazil, yeah. And uh, in the same way, like taking into account the local specificities and the needs. Yeah. And we know that in the case of Brazil, that she, uh, she talked about indigenous and uh, quilombolas, communities that they have, of course, special 
needs that is necessary to take into account when we are promoting uh, solutions. Yeah, and now to go ahead with our speakers and the amazing uh, uh, spreading the word here. Uh, the next one that I would like to invite is Carlos Bello from Mexico. I first I would like to thank you because I know that in Latin America is really, really <laughs> early for, for you to be here. So please uh, go ahead and you can introduce yourself and try to answer our provocations. Please, Carlos. Uh, thank you very much, Natalia. Uh, can you hear me? If you just thumbs up. Okay. Yes, perfect. very nice. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if it's early or, or late, 3 a.m. in the morning, <laughs> but it's kind of in the middle. Uh, but I'm very thankful. Uh, many thanks for the to the uh, for the invitation. No, uh, thank you very much, Raquel, for considering me to be a speaker here, and and thanks to all of the other speakers. Uh, I'm very honored talking to you here. Um, going back to the to the questions, the provocative questions. Uh, the, the first one on on how emerging technologies uh, can be used to expand affordable access. Well, we all know that access is obviously key nowadays in in a digital economy for development, and there are many ways to access uh, or to provide access to individuals. Um, it also depends on the countries, no? And every country has a different situation. For example, we have Uruguay that it's pretty much all connected because their geography is not high mountains. And so it's, it's easy to connect everyone. Uh, but on the other hand, we have countries like Brazil, uh, Colombia and Mexico, where I'm from, uh, in which it is more difficult to have connectivity for everyone because uh, there are some areas that are very hard to reach and they are not really uh, cost effective no, for companies. Uh, this is where government has to jump in no, because the private sector is not going to make the investments to, you know, to, to go and ha have connectivity in areas that are not, uh, are not going to give the returns. And how does how can government uh, interfere? And we'll talk about that in a second. But um, the different ways in which people can connect are listed in your uh, in your provocative questions. And first of all, it's uh, with the mobile spectrum. No, for mobile, we need to put towers, and 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 you can always do combinations. But what do we need? from the mobile perspective because it's not only it's not only asking governments to go and build the infrastructure where private companies cannot get you know it's it's a combination of more things a government has to promote regulation or to issue regulation that allows private sector to build out the infrastructure. I am very convinced that uh, there cannot be complete coverage if the private sector is not really involved. No, in, in Latin America, and maybe some of my colleagues will agree with me, we're very accustomed to say, Father government, come on and bring me the connectivity. No, um, I think it shouldn't work like that. I mean, it, it's a part of, of, of the process, but uh, I think government should have all the all the regulation and make it easy for people to provide service. So, from the mobile perspective, using the mobile spectrum, you know, for cellular and and things like that, there should be more competition. There should be regulation for the MBNOs, the mobile virtual network operators, which are growing fast in Latin America. They are well developed in in Europe. But in Latin America, they're growing fast and, and government also needs to understand them because, you know, it's, it's hard to have your MBNO, at least in, in, 
in Mexico. And sometimes the authorities, some of the authorities uh, do not have full knowledge of what an MBNO is. And they treat you as if you were a, a regular operator. Uh, and, you know, they are learning slowly, but they should be very open to all different business models. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's not an easy task. And obviously, this I think this is a requirement in all over the world, uh, spectrum fees. No, They have to be uh, reduced or th there's got to be a vision from government that spectrum fees are not to get you know, immediate money for programs. Uh, spectrum fees should be accessible and should allow uh, the service providers uh, to develop, you know, it should not be like a heavy load on the spectrum providers. No, uh, there we got to find a balance between spectrum fees and how to uh, how to make or oblige the operators to develop infrastructure and 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 use it as a payment of those government fees. No, um, also. The regulation has to be thinking about Internet of Things. You know, not everything's going to be voice and Internet access, but Internet of Things is going to become very, very important. And regulation, some regulations may not be ready for it. That's from the side of the mobile. From the side of the fiber, uh, fiber, at least in Mexico, it was a, a, a huge growth of 35% of fiber between 2019 and 2020. This is because pandemics, everybody started requesting internet access. So the, the installation of fiber grew a lot, but the main problem with fiber, at least in Mexico and some other Latin American countries, is that the installation or the permits to install the, the fiber on the streets, the antennas, uh, is subject to local authorities. And, you know, in, in big countries or in medium-sized countries, you have as many local authorities as you can think of. And the regulation is different between one and the other. And that is really complicated. Uh, some regulators in, the, in, in Latin America have uh, have understood that's a problem and they are working with local authorities trying to uh, make them understand that allowing internet infrastructure, telecom infrastructure is much better for their localities. And there are good examples in Colombia and Mexico of model regulation. Um, also, you have the WISPs, the wireless internet service providers. Uh, Renata did talk about it, uh, uh, communities, and the WISPs are private companies, individuals, you know, uh, individuals who just finished their, their career, you know, their major in engineering and started putting infrastructure for their own internet and then they sold to the neighbor the neighbor and then to the other one to the other to the other one and in mexico at least we've seen a growth of wisps it's a it's a very very important uh, piece for coverage i believe that without the wisps there will be no complete coverage because they are identified with their community and they you know it's it's a, a job now. It's now a real job. It's easy to to become with technology. It's easy to become a service provider, an internet service provider. You know, many years ago, providing internet was for big companies. Now, it, it can be achievable and a good business for a family. So, I think WISP is one of the solution. And finally, a satellite technology. A, of course, in many countries without satellite technology, there cannot be communications. Uh, is the easiest way to reach some places. Uh, it may not be the very ideal for voice services, but it is for internet access. No, it's 
cheap to deploy because there's a small infrastructure that is required. But we have new players in the satellite industry, uh, Starlink, OneWeb, et cetera, et cetera. And they are, uh, their satellites are uh, in the low earth orbit. So uh, the problems that we have with the geostationary satellites, which is a delay and it's hard for voice services, we will no longer have it with the, with the LEOS. But in that sense, regulation does have to be uh, allowing companies to develop and to let them do business because eventually it, they will reach communities. Um, it's also important to note that there shouldn't be a fight between all these technologies because we always have the fight of the of the mobile against the satellites and against the WISPs and you know discussions all over. But every well, at least most of the countries need all of these technologies to have a complete complete coverage in in their country. So uh, it's important to not only focus on coverage being technology neutral but also on capacity building, you know? having people understanding how to use internet, the importance of internet uh, and how internet access even really helps the economy to grow. You know? That's on the first question that you posted. On the policy solutions, and I'll be very brief on this, you also posted a question, you know? what, what um practical locally driven solutions uh, from policy uh, exist and i would say that uh, i'm going to touch a little bit on, on mexico which is uh, what i am most familiar with um we are in a generation for the regulator uh, based on ITU, International Telecommunications Union Best Practices, they are already on, on a fifth generation of regulators. You know? First generation was privatization, in the, then independent regulator, a competition, blah, blah, blah. Now we are focusing, the regulator has to focus on collaborative regulation. And you touch on that. Uh, all the different authorities have to collaborate. We're, we shouldn't focus only on telecom and ICT, you know, as we've been doing for many years. Now the telecom and ICT regulator has to collaborate with other authorities, you know, environment and on, on e-waste, uh, economy on promoting small and medium-sized enterprises. And collaboration also needs involving the private sector. You know? When you come up with regulation, you do an open consultation and you receive feedback of the people that are going to be benefited of the regulation. So the regulation should, since it's across all sectors, it should be focused on digital economy, okay? We should no longer be talking only about tower and telecommunications. We should be seeing a whole new and complete digital economy and telecommunication infrastructure is a tool to reach that digital economy. Uh, this is what the ITU calls the the five uh, the generation five uh, collaborative regulation. It's not five G; it's G five. So <laughs> just so we don't get confused, um, and you know, uh, collaboration not only across the uh, federal authorities and not only authority with private sector, but also federal authorities with local authorities. I am, I truly believe that if the local authorities are not involved and do not understand the importance of having the community connected, we will not go anywhere. Uh, it is, you know, there's evidence that Every time you have more connectivity, the economy grows. You know, it's uh, it allows the people 
in the in the small community to focus on a business no like like i said internet access um maybe the 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 kids that just finished college in, in the in the small community or that went out and came back to, to start providing service you know instead of instead of opening a, a store for sweatshirts or whatever they open their own business uh, the, their own internet access service and they, they start with the internet cafe and start developing uh, to provide an internet to more places in the community so I think the biggest role of the authorities is to identify what can they do to promote and make it easy for people and for companies with a strong focus on small and medium-sized enterprises to provide internet access, to allow them to install infrastructure and do business because every single access point has to be sustainable otherwise it will be nice for the picture you know it will be there for a month or two and then it will go nowhere and this is why also in brazil with the program renata mentioned it you know you develop you involve the whole community and you let everybody participate so um you know, just uh, as a, to, to sum up, uh, I believe internet access should be allowed using all of the technologies available, not focus on only one. Uh, it, and it should be uh, accompanied with very good regulation, flexible, and with a strong focus on small and medium-sized enterprises. With that, uh, we probably have a better chance to have broad coverage than just a government program, you know, taking internet to specific communities. And I'll be very happy to discuss further on this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos, for uh, talk about a little bit uh, from the perspective of the from the company sector from the private sector was really insightful to see your mapping of the whole all different types of um, companies that could offer the, the service and about the collaborative approach that you you mentioned that is really important in fact and I have a lot of questions, but I will keep this a little bit aside uh, to, in fact, to call our next speaker, that is Juan Peirano from Internet Society. So bringing this uh, perspective from the technical community is really important. So please, Juan, go ahead. Hi, uh, Natalia, hopefully everyone can hear me and see me okay. Um, I'm very, very honored and, and uh, very happy to be here among, I think at this point we are all friends and, and we have been discussing uh, these topics for uh, for a long time. So thank you very much, Raquel and Natalia for, for the invitation. Um, I think one of the, of the benefits of being one of the last speakers uh, at the end of the week of the IGF is that we can leverage from what uh, a lot of people said before. And um, I would like to start with um, something that, that came up um, and, and Ariet uh, mentioned it during uh, the uh, PNMA, uh, the Policy Network uh, for Meaningful Access uh, panel discussion alongside others. Uh, she mentioned uh, about the complexity that we have in the in the connectivity uh, landscape right now and how that is also connected with the intrinsic uh, complexity that, that that human relationships have. So um, I think that was a, a very insightful way of uh, as a kickstart to try to, to, to find some of the solutions that we need to find, uh, especially in, in the region, but also around the world on how to connect um, and, and probably many of you have seen 
uh, the figures uh, published by the ITU in the report, uh, facts and figures that over 3 billion uh, people are still unconnected. So, and that comes from um, also another, another uh, um, issue that I wanted to discuss with you today is about the trends that we are following, that we are uh, seeing today about how quickly are we connecting these people that are unconnected. Uh, but getting back to the complexity, complexity, I think um, one of the key issues there is that um, us as humans, uh, we don't like complexity. Our brains don't like complexity. Uh, we like to see things uh, in many cases black and white. We want to have an opinion. We want to stick to that opinion. We want to um, understand what is happening. So every time we face uh, challenges that have complexity by themselves, uh, in many cases, it's very difficult for us to to uh, to face them. So, in this case, in the connectivity case, and, and when we're trying to connect people, I think we need to acknowledge that complexity, the complexity of of uh, human existence, so to speak. But at the same time, trying to focus on the things that we can achieve and try to untangle uh, that complexity uh, in, and find those knots where. Uh, in each of, of, of our cases, we can actually untangle them and, and try to to, uh, to find a more streamlined solutions for, for everything. And um, I'm very grateful for uh, Renata's presentation uh, before uh, me and Carlos, because I think the, the Anatel example is one of the best examples that we have in, in the region. It's one of many, because I think um, Argentina has very good examples. Mexico has very good examples. Colombia has very good examples. Um, now Bolivia and Paraguay is working. So I think uh, also the, the Latin America region is, is pioneering many of these um, solutions that are trying to untangle the complexity uh, that we have there. Um, and let me again uh, refer back to, to the Anatel, so, uh, the Anatel um, uh, work that they did with APC and, and uh, with the UK government and other stakeholders. I see Carlos, Carlos Afonso here on the call. He has uh, work with with Anatel for many years, and um, I know that that Natalia and Raquel as well. So um, it's 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 very uh, important to uh, take a deeper look at the um, Anatel example and see how we can bring that example to to other uh, um, to other uh, uh, countries in the region. Um, because I think the way that the multi stakeholder approach worked in that case was was very beneficial and. It approached one of the issues that um, I think we need to untangle, and it's the, the uh, connectivity networks uh, landscape and the access to rural areas. So um, I believe that that uh, it's it's very uh, important for us to follow up in during the discussion about that. Um, but also, um, uh, Carlos mentioned Uruguay. I'm I'm originally from Uruguay. I'm not based there anymore, but it is true that it's very easy to connect people in Uruguay because it's very flat, and we are only three billion. Uh, Compared to Brazil and Argentina, our closest neighbors, we are a peck of dust in, in Latin America in terms of, uh, of connectivity. Um, but nonetheless, um, I wanted to, to mention that my parents live in the countryside and my father had to walk like one kilometer to speak with me that I'm uh, in another country uh, to have uh, some sort of connectivity. So it's, it's still not even. And in countries that are as easier to connect as Uruguay, uh, because there is a, 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 um, a lot of support from, from the government, from the um, uh, state operator, from the public sector, for from from many many stakeholders in the in the country. Even in that situation, we are not reaching everyone. So I think we we need to to make sure that we address the issues that we need to address in each of the of the cases. And that brings us to uh, the question about the local uh, needs. And I think. That's one of the key issues why we are not connecting as many people as we used to at the beginning of the century. Um, we reached the easiest to connect people in in, in urban areas. Uh, we had all our all the the money ready, all the technical um, technical availability was there with equipment and everything. But now we are slowing down, so we need to find those innovative solutions uh, that to reach those places where. It's harder to connect, and um, again, um, I, I think Brazil uh, uh, and their work is is 
is is a testimony of that and and some of the issues that i think they are raising there about licensing spectrum management and financing mechanisms are are key uh in terms of policy to achieve the uh, universal connectivity that we want to achieve um but also uh we need to take make sure that we um put some effort again to uh to make the complex issues less complex we need to also um have some considerations about mapping. Um, we need to make sure that we promote enabling policies that uh, that enable again. Uh, sorry for 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 uh, for saying that two times, but that that try to uh, to support uh, open data frameworks that are uh, conducive to understand what the um, connectivity landscape in in the region is uh, in terms of fiber deployment, in terms of coverage, um, in terms of population density and sensors. I think there is still uh, 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 an avenue that we need to uh, to uh, to go through there in terms of, of mapping and how, um, how honest are with ourselves about who are the people that are actually covered, what are, uh, who are the people that are actually connected or who are the people that are closer to um, a fiber that can actually connect because there is a, a point of presence there uh, because it's not only being closer to the fiber but also it, it cannot be the, just just a cable it needs to be a, a, a place where you can actually connect so there are there are uh, many many points in in, in in, that that we need to address in terms of mapping that I, I think will also benefit in the in the next few years in the in the runner up into uh, 2030 and trying uh, to achieve that uh, sustainable development goals uh, that is related to affordability. So all of them are, are together. But going into some of the of the uh, a little bit on on details uh, before I, I yield my time, I think. Uh, the, in the, again, the case of licensing, spectrum management, and funding magazines is sort of sort of like a package that we need to address to connect uh, the the unconnected people in the region. In the sense that, and Carlos mentioned this already, we need to make sure that we allow people to be licensed to provide services. Uh, it needs to be affordable for a small operator to uh, get a license and easy bureaucratically. If we are making the process too difficult and too costly. Uh, those people that have the intention to bring connectivity to a certain area that is currently are either poorly connected or it has a deficit in infrastructure. If we don't, uh, as 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 regulators and as an, as policymakers, we don't make an effort to give them a, a, like a like a like a push and say, yeah, I'm, I will not make your life more miserable. Uh, I will I will try to help you with a licensing framework that is easy for you and it's accessible for you and also that it's um, covering the needs of of the region that you want to uh, that you want to provide a service in um, and after after that initial that initial um, how can I say the the, the way of, of making things easier for licensing i think the spectrum management that is a little bit more technical but um it has it has also uh uh it's it's directly related with with the licensing frameworks um we need to make sure that we have uh technical infrastructure and that there are many many uh examples around the world and i think in latin america we are doing a, a great job for example with wi-fi 6 i think we are doing uh, a very good um uh, management of spectrum related to Wi-Fi 6 and give as much unlicensed spectrum as we can and having the whole 6 GHz band uh, unlicensed for Wi-Fi 6 I think it's a it's a uh, a very interesting and, and positive move in the in the in the runner-up to connect people because as you know uh, uh, well uh, I think Carlos mentioned mobile but many of the of the most of the of the bandwidth is used it, when those models are uh, offloaded to Wi-Fi uh, networks, so Wi-Fi itself as a technology and allies spectrum is key to achieve um, not only universal access but to promote affordability and to promote better quality of 
of connectivity in those places where they are now a certain level of connectivity that um, uh, it's not, um, and, and panelists before us mentioned, it's not meaningful, or it's not, um, it, it's not reaching the, the needs of, of the people. Um, and finally, uh, I think we, we mentioned spectrum management, but it, there are also many, not many, but several um, very interesting ways of uh, managing spectrum that are related with dynamic spectrum allocation or use it or shared frameworks and uh, spectrum databases. I think in the region we are still, uh, in the lag region, we have, um, um, again, a, a way to go there because those are very, uh, at least from, from, from um, at this point, I think in many cases are, are, are costly solutions and not always easy to implement. But I think we need to go through also to uh, to walk that avenue of, of, of work so we can use the spectrum in a way that it's not seen as a scarce resource because um, it's very important to 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 uh, to also to realize that uh, portraying spectrum as a scarce resource and as a costly resource is a fabrication of the way that uh, on how we manage that spectrum. Um, spectrum are just frequencies that are there. So uh, if we don't purposefully uh, look for solutions to make that management more easy or more equitable or um, more uh, uh, affordable, it's it's because of us, because of the people that are uh, managing it. So I think that there is also a way of, of, of working there uh, that we can achieve uh, better policies. And finally, the funding mechanisms, and, and Carlos mentioned this, um, and Renata as well, um, there is a, there is a, I think that the, it's also tightly related with licensing because, um, and it's sort of like a catch-22 so, uh, situation when, if you're, a, for example, a community network at, at ISOC, at the organization that I work uh, in, uh, we promote complementary access solutions and uh, community networks by themselves. Um, if you are not legal or is it, if, if it's too difficult for you to get a license as a community network, how can you expect to get funding mechanisms? And, and when, I, when I talk about funding mechanisms, I, I'm talking about the, the most traditional ones, like getting a loan from, for, from the bank, uh, getting people to invest in your uh, community-owned business. Um, so if we don't make the licensing frameworks easier and, 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 and affordable, it will be very difficult for those small operators to get the right funding that they need. And um, we always use, and I think it's very, very important to, to mention the universal service funds in the region. Um, uh, we, uh, many people here in the, in the, in the call uh, might know that in the, in the region, not uh, the, the universal service funds are not used all the time in the ways that they're supposed to. And um, if we have, again, the example of community networks, if a community network could achieve a license at, at the same time, will automatically be part of the telecommunications ecosystem from a country and then maybe try to uh, grab a little of, of, of that money that is, that is uh, in many cases, standing there in the universal service funds in many countries. Um, so again, I, I think, again, the, the package of licensing, spectrum management and funding mechanisms, it's one. And then also tightly related, but uh, uh, not directly, is the mapping solutions that we need to address. And finally, uh, the affordability. And I think I'm going to uh, leave it there. Uh, I took like 10 or 12 minutes, so uh, I think it's enough. <laughs> and I invite everyone to ask questions and, and have a good discussion. Thank you, Natalia. Thank you, Juan, for your insightful inputs. And now I, I call Raquel Renaud from Article 19 to put your insights from this question, these questions and these topics that we are discussing here, please, Raquel, go ahead. The floor is yours. Ah, and after Raquel, we have a, a some time to have, to ask some questions. So pre be prepared to participate and ask questions for our panelists. So Raquel. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia. Thank you, everyone, who had to wake up so early for the session. 
And I think that when we planned it, we thought about having people and examples, as, as we said in the description of the, of the panel, positive examples, just to change a little bit the dynamic, because in many sessions we are, or many times we meet as a multi-stakeholder group, we tend to say, well, this is missing, this is, you're not doing this, you're not doing that. And we kind of try to gather examples because Brazil and Mexico are real, good examples every time we talk about community networks those are um, the examples that we that we mentioned for sure we might of course add others because there are luckily more examples in different uh, countries more and more but brazil and mexico are a reference uh, we know the the work that citel is doing that reflect that so we wanted to start from this kind of uh, optimistic and basically giving concrete examples that were basically you know, presented by you all, saying that this is possible, no? So we're not saying, we're not talking about utopia, we're not talking about something that might be possible in a few decades, we're talking about a future that is here, it's now, which it's different from saying that we're looking for a single solution to implement in other regions or other countries. And I just wanted, really wanted to compliment because I think that the main elements were already described and presented by you all. But, and many times when we all um, work with a uh, forum like the IGF and then the ITU um, or our coalitions, local, regional, international coalitions, we tend to be asked like, okay, but this is just uh, some techie stuff. Why, why does it matter for, you know, everyday people in everyday lives? And I just want to, to give some examples of what's going on uh, right now, because I think that when the solutions that were proposed and presented here, uh, when we say that they are important, they are, they have impact in, in, real life, no? So for example, when Carlos was, were talk, was talking about the diversity of providers and diversity of technology, this is very important because we know that uh, in specific forums, there are some technologies and he mentioned the mobile technology, it's getting stronger and stronger. And in official research, like the facts and figures from the ITU and others, official numbers that we have from from some countries the mobile industry is just getting bigger and bigger which uh if you just have the map like that you might think oh this is the technology that people prefer which i my question is it really true or is it what's basically available you know for spectrum issues for different uh reasons and what happened in uh, some countries, uh, we conducted uh, um, some field work together with uh, local organizations uh, of three, three or four years ago. And basically what they were saying is that um, the fact that uh, WhatsApp, for example, was being part of the prepaid plans that were used, but most of the population, uh, could present a problem, could be easily weaponized, and it was, and we all know uh, in, I mean, anyone who is from our region, how WhatsApp as a source of information is a very complex and very difficult issue. And it's one of the main disinformation issues because, you know, it was very easy to say, okay, instead of just using the traditional media who has have some rules of what they're gonna you know publish or not with all the criticism we might have with the media they have to follow some rules and face some consequences if they publish something that it's a completely uh, complete lie that cannot be proven etc cetera, etc cetera. but if you use a chat service then you don't have to worry about that and that's what happened no, and it was easy to get to people who hardly had some internet, but suddenly had information 
information <laughs> coming via WhatsApp that they couldn't even uh, fact check because fact checking would imply that they have to use the data cap and sometimes they don't have data in the pre pre um, paid plans, for example. So this is a concrete example that basically affected democracies. No. Um, also, we heard Jane talking also in the Meaningful Connectivity main session, uh, I don't know if it was yesterday or the day before yesterday, that although it's important to try to think about what do we mean by meaningful connectivity, we have to be aware that there are, you know, a, a complexity of solutions, no? So complexity, now I'm saying in a good, in a positive way, not complex, like in terms of how do we untangle that? But uh, there are so many cultures and so many ways to use the internet, no? The same way, this is not new because um, when I'm starting uh, studying media, it was in the nineties, um, we were studying some, we were doing some case studies in the Amazon and the communities there use the radio as, uh, what we might call the telephone, no? So they say, happy birthday, or, you know, come here because you forgot your, your clothes that you have to, to take to wash. And this was transmitted in, in the local radios because it was easier for the people since the, since the transportation was basically uh, done by boat. No, so they kind of subvert the original idea of the radio and use the radio for local one-on-one uh, -on -one communication. And of course, the internet uh, should be open for that as well, as well, no? So this is what happens when we say what the community needs, because it's not in a top-down way, like, please tell me what you need that we're gonna provide to you. They already know what they want, so it's just basically leave them the possibility to, you know, manage to actually work on the technology, like in a plastic way and shape it in a way that they find meaningful. And this is different from having this one size fit all solutions that are mostly sold by, by you know, traditional mobile um, companies. And this is really important because, you know, as I said, I gave the example, this extreme example of the democracy being harmed by, by something that had to do with, uh, started with the infrastructure because local organizations said that this could be a problem before it was actually a problem. So they knew the risks, no? And the, this prepaid plan is also something that happens in suburban areas where people there are considered connected in official numbers, but are they, I mean, what kind of connection do you really have if WhatsApp is your main source of everything in terms of information? So, so of course, I'm talking from someone from Article 19. So I'm talking about specific, you know, access to the right to access uh, to information. What kind of information do you access? You know, when you just have access to one app and also respect the diversity of ways people communicate. This is also freedom of expression, no? And, but at the same time, for example, I, um, well, anyone who worked with grassroots groups in Brazil, at least, I, I, I'm pretty sure in Mexico and Peru and Colombia is the same, uh, were approached by groups who want to have a specific community network shaped not only in a traditional way, like we want to access the internet, but they want to have internal local communication that doesn't depend on the traditional uh, providers because when they are under attack, they have to know. And sometimes one of the things that happened just before an attack is that the traditional communication is cut and they don't have access to their phones. So, some, you know, this is some of the demands. So this is also part of the thing that have to be taken into consideration. Some of the minorities, some of the groups there might be dissidents or might be in a struggle with uh, the power that is 
basically deciding what kind of communication uh, this community will have. Now I'm talking about local, regional power, no? So I think that um, just brought this kind of a more gloomy uh, um, scenario because we had three people here talking about positive solutions that this, uh, what ISOC has been doing around the world. It's amazing. We have all these reports showing concrete results and showing that this is possible. You know, different ways of communicating that it's possible. It's being done. Um, what Carla said and, and the work with the satellite, not, you know, Starlink satellite, but different different technology under the same technology is also possible, no? And what Renata said and what they developed with APC and APC also work with local organizations, including um, Article 19, Instituto Benstar, Article 19 Brazil, of course, Instituto Benstar and others uh, show that this is possible, no? So Anatel is huge and is taking care of, uh, you know, imagine Brazil has continental um, uh, size, but still it was possible to be done and it was done, no? And it was just launched. So I think that this is what I wanted to, to just show that, you know, sometimes we are um, involved in our local uh, routine and local situation and we think first, there's no solution, everything, you know, um, it's going backwards or we say, this is too much, how can I you know, be in contact and change a structure that is so uh, solidly um, built by the big telecom operators and the huge regulators. So, um, you know, these are all the examples saying that it is possible and it can be done. So when we talk about replication, it's not like replicate one idea and implement what is done in Oaxaca in some community in Mali, it's not about that, but talking in a big picture, it is possible, it is doable. No? So that's that's it, thank you. Uh, thank you, Raquel, for you explore many different topics, really important. And uh, now we have uh, this more or less like 17 minutes for some discussion if, with our our participants and we i also see here that we have a question from the 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 chat and juliana you read for us please all right um so we got a question from carlos um he would like to hear more uh from renata from anatel uh, about the recent decisions on licensing the uh six gigahertz band uh for Wi-Fi 6E and the prospects of using this band for community networks. So uh, please, Renata, if you could address this, this question. And if, he, if somebody else wants to, uh, to put other questions, we are still waiting for questions yeah, from on-site and online. So Renata, please. Um, thank you for the question. Um, actually, I see uh, Wi-Fi 6 and uh, 6G as uh, uh, one to um, uh, in addition, actually, because uh, I think uh, Wi-Fi 6, it was a great job we had uh, last year, but we has also TV white space that's uh, being approval. We have this, um, all these obligations and the uh, 5G um, notice that about um, education, about the more democratic way of licenses. Um, we have um, uh, the decrease of some fees. Uh, so I, I, I actually, I, um, when we talk about Wi-Fi 6, I think it will be really, actually really, um, Great. We, um, I think it was approved. It was a very good job. But in the spectral area, I see uh, Wi-Fi 6 as one more tool uh, in all this environment. So uh, we 
we have some specific because uh, of course we have some uh, specific solutions for each case so um uh, uh, wi-fi 6 it's it's a great solution satellite telecom satellite communication it's also a good solution depending on the case um short waves uh in the amazon case it's uh, another great solution so um actually uh, that's um um how i i actually see uh, wi-fi uh fixing all this environment and also um lots of uh different uh more um uh different um um uh, with uh, uh, about the spectrum, we have all um, lots of um, of um, how can I say that more uh, cases like uh, spectrum access for back home, um, low fees, uh, this uh, sharing of uh, five five G spectrum for community networks, um, not only as a secondary market, there's a um, res restricted. Um, spectrum so uh, i think uh that's um that's what a decision a great decision and i think it will help help as the other technologies and the other tools we have i think we we need to use all of them depending on the case i think it's it thank you thank you renato thank we you. have some uh, questions from on site yes please go I had to uh, present yourself for the, the panelists to before your question and please say if you are addressing for somebody specific or to all the panel okay thank you thank you Lana. thank you very much yeah I, i'm roberto zambrana coming from bolivia from our local nri i would like to ask uh, the two colleagues well, the three actually, the, the ones that were talking about, uh, I think it was Carlos, about um, the new approaches of the different actors like uh, WISPs, wireless internet service providers, which actually in some cases in some countries are maybe creating some sort of disturbance in the market. And it's good to know that there is a chance to, uh, to coexist with the traditional uh, ISPs. So that's what I would like to ask in the experiences that he mentioned in Mexico or in some other places, how the, um, the regulators are dealing with this, how are they are providing this kind of, of um, harmonic uh, convivence between these two kind of very, very, of course, different operators. And the second question is related to um, what do you think uh, I don't have any specific uh, participant or panelist to answer this one, but I would like to know their opinion about what do, what can we expect in the future regarding business models, knowing that most of our operators in the region have abandoned the deployment of uh, fixed internet service, and they are more uh, attracted to deploy, um, of course it's natural, to deploy wireless mobile services. So um, if we're going to expect that this will continue in the future with new different technologies like 5G, then what should we expect about the business model? Thank you. Thank you uh, for, since we have 11 minutes to finish our session, I would say to, I will try to give like the, time for everyone to explore the question for our uh, participant and also if you could uh, put together some final final remarks also I think it's a good idea to wrap up in some way our discussion okay so uh, maybe Renata you can start like trying to address uh, Roberto, questions and uh, and also some final remarks. Yeah, thanks, Roberto. Um, and, you know, about the, the business model on the future, but it's more attractive than uh, as you ask. Um, I think the, the the key is radio spectrum 
uh, links are the key of the success uh, already uh, for this project. We have um, IoT um, coming with very strong and uh, a very strong way. Uh, so we need to adopt ourselves, not only in the, in the, as a equipment, fees, uh, spectrum in a more democratic way. As you know, Brazil have a, um, a deep uh, 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 differences from classes. Uh, we have a situation that more than 15 million people nowadays uh, are in the, below the poverty line. Um, we've only, I don't know, 27 million below the poor line and 50% uh, percent of households still don't have any uh, internet. So uh, um, I think regarding to this, we can see that we have also uh, 220 million cell phones. That's a good, good number. But if you see, uh, 170 million are prepaid. So uh, we just need to see that um, it's not uh, it's they have they have access to internet but they have a limited access to data. So I think that the the challenges for the future is to change to to this, this model to have more quality in access and um, I think this community networks can be a, a good way. Um, uh, to reach and all these measures with spectrum, as Raquel said, uh, she said our technical stuff uh, matters. Yes, matters because it makes all the difference when you put in a, I don't know, when we, we make the, the 5G um, grant now, uh, recently um, and we just make the obligation for education, for investment in infrastructure, uh, fixed it, and um, not only in 5G, but I think we can, uh, uh, we, 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 like, we have a 4G, um, I think, and um, uh, we intend, with the 5G notice, we intend to cover the 4G broadband to more than uh, 9,600 rural locations. So I think it's a, it's a good measure, not the measure only about the, um, I don't know if it was Carlos or Juan that said, um, don't remember, but um, not, not just the money that matters, but I think that this, all this obligation makes lots of difference and can really make difference in the, um, these challenges for the, the future. So um, I think that's it. Spectrum, I think it's the key now and with this, this um, different obligations, not only fee, not only money, but obligation to investment in infrastructure, uh, obligation in a different way to use the spectrum with more democratic way. I think uh, that's, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Leto. Thank you for all. Okay, now yeah. I, oh, I would like to pass to Juan, Juan, can you explore a little bit the, the question and also make some final remarks? Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, thank you very much. And first of all, I would like to thank uh, uh, Raquel for um, her comments about both complexity and seeing complexity in a good thing and also um, making reassure that what we are talking today is not a fantasy. It's something that is happening now. And it's happening in the region and again the region is is pioneering many things um and some examples uh mexico has a uh, license for uh social purpose uh, argentina is using usf to promote uh, cns brazil is having uh, their efforts with uh, cns uh, now uh, in colombia there is there is um uh, colnodo one of uh, our partners and, and also a member of apc is, is doing uh, some testing with IMT frameworks, uh, IMT uh, spectrum for uh, deploying uh, uh, an actual a whole structure of, of uh, mobile operators at CN. So things are happening, things are getting, it's real. So uh, we should, I think we should make sure that we uh, understand what we are doing. Um, in terms of, of the business models, um, 
I have my preference. If uh, if I have to decide, I'll I will do everything fiber. <laughs> um, because uh, I was talking with uh, some of uh, fiber operators uh, a, week, a couple of weeks ago, and and they said uh, fiber has infinite capacity, and and it's sort of true um, in the sense that uh, we are evolving in fiber. We're making it cheaper. Uh, it's very, uh, it's become very cheaper to deploy and also to maintain. Uh, so if that's my preference, I don't know if, if the market is going that way. Um, and, but I think uh, there is always uh, a case to be made for fiber in every in every um, uh, situation. Both, of course, it's more expensive to do in an urban area because you have to uh, do some more civil uh, uh, work, engineering work, but. If you take into account the countryside, especially where um, the geography is is more uh, it's more welcoming, I think fiber should be also uh, always a a, a solution. Uh, and, and there is a, a, in terms of examples, there is a great example of, of a community network called Barn here in the UK. Uh, they are deploying fiber everywhere, uh, one gigabit per second uh, um, upload and download. So it's a it's a really, really uh, uh, capable CN that we have uh, totally uh, fiber here in the UK, at the north part in Yorkshire in the UK. Um, but uh, as a as a closing remark, I think uh, again, I th the 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 lag region, the Latin America and Caribbean region is being a pioneer in many of these uh, solutions. Um, I think we need to keep working as as we're working especially um, towards WTDC uh, next year, uh, where some of the many many of the uh, development um, agenda will be defined uh, for the next four years um, within the ITU. And I think, uh, from a regulatory perspective and from a policy perspective, I think we need to um, the old stakeholders we need to focus uh, a lot of our efforts there and and make sure that we bring all the positive examples and also the challenges that, that Raquel mentioned uh, about centralization and about um, and, and about concentration of, of, of uh, services like WhatsApp or, or others um, and try to make sure that we address, uh, we, we bring uh, the local needs to a global context uh, in, a, in, a, in a meaningful way. Um, I think that's it. I will give uh, the floor to other colleagues. Okay, thank you, Juan, for your statements. We have very few minutes, and I, of course, ask some little bit more minutes for our colleagues from the, the Zoom and uh, from here, the IGF, the, the room also. Don't cut us, please, <laughs> just to, to assure that everybody has the time to make, make a final remarks. But anyways, I will ask to you to be quick, yeah, because we have like not so much time. And now uh, I call Carlos to try to explore a little bit, the, answer the question from our colleague and also final remarks, please. Thank you, and thanks, everyone. Uh, to respond to Roberto, uh, WISPs, uh, they have been growing. I think they, they've existed even before there was a license for them. You know, technology has a way through exist, and then, you know, no matter if, if they're regulated or not, it comes, it exists, and then regulation catches up. So in Mexico, the development of WISP has been very, very important. And the regulator, IFT, is very close to them. Uh, fortunately, having a license to resell telecommunications or to have your own WISP is as simple as filling out a piece of paper. And, and you fill it out, you send it to a regulator, and if they don't respond in certain time, it's an automatic yes. Uh, more than ever, I've seen, uh, I work at a law firm, BGBG, and, and I've seen many, 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 many uh, entrepreneurs starting their internet business. Uh, 
And this is, I think it, this is wonderful. If we get all the WISP together in Mexico, I am sure we have probably a, an operator as big as the fourth operator in Mexico. No, so it's very important. Uh, they connect. They connect with the, the local community, and this brings me closer to to the other issue. Uh, I, I agree with uh, Renata about spectrum being very, very important, but I think, and, and also agree with Juan that fiber is going to be the problem solution because uh, all the WISPs in Mexico, they start with the spectrum, but spectrum is limited uh, and it's, it's hard to access. And most of the WISP are trying to install infrastructure. I mean, they go from, from wireless to, uh, to fiber, but they cannot give the step, you know, if there is no spectrum. So as I said from the very beginning, they're complementary. You cannot go one or the other. And, uh, and basically, you know, uh, to sum up, uh, I, I call authorities, to be very, very open and make it easy for everybody to install infrastructure and have their own business. Thank you, uh, Natalia and, Rena and, and uh, Raquel and everybody. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have uh, now here people say to me two minutes and we close the session, please. <laughs> so Raquel, it's your turn. You have two minutes and <laughs> that's it. I don't need two minutes. I think that you know the everyone here already said what was needed to said, and I think that um, that's you know the outcome that we were waiting just to showcase all these positive um, alternatives and say that you know what we are preaching it's doable, it's being done, and it has to be done more. So that's it. Thank you very much, everyone. So thank you for all all panelists. The the the, the things were really insightful. I think uh, I hope that these examples could be spread and uh, uh, let a lot of people knowing that it's possible to achieve different approaches, innovative approach to connect the un unconnected people and also to have a better access and also I thank all the, the participants on site and online for putting the questions and participating so that's it we see around bye from Poland <laughs>